Rolling Chair Shot. Hello, I am Scott Sigler, author of this book, Alive. Welcome to episode number 16, including this episode. There are only five episodes left. It all wraps up with episode number 20. There will be an episode 21 and 22, but those will be Q&A episodes where fans send in questions and I answer them. If you want to listen to that, it might be audio only, so subscribe to my podcast. Go to scottsigler.com slash iTunes, take you to a one-click link on iTunes, click that, you'll get all the episodes imported right into iTunes every week and you'll be able to hear that Q&A. But with only five episodes left, you will soon be out of reading and or listening material from me, so I want to suggest that you check out Infected, which is book one of a trilogy I wrote a couple of years ago. But I warn you, this is a little different from Alive. This is some seriously hardcore horror. It is not for weak ears or weak stomachs. So if you don't like really gory, in-your-face horror, it might not be for you. Now, we're talking about episode number 16 of Alive. In the last episode, a giant bombshell was dropped on M as she was told that the inescapable dungeon is not actually a dungeon at all. The place she and her friends have been is not even what she could have possibly conceived. She was given this information by a grown-up named Brewer. Brewer also claims that M murdered him, so he's clearly got to be insane according to M because she's talking to him and obviously he is alive. That is also the name of this book. This is episode number 16 of Alive, and I hope you enjoy it. Goodbye! 34. You are wrong, wrong, wrong quite a lot, are you not? That's what Brewer said to me. He's right. We all stare at the spinning sphere out in the blackness. Below us and on our sides, the moving stars seem to spin in time with the planet, as if they are pinned to it by infinitely long invisible sticks. Stars and planet, all spinning in the same direction. The twins stand close together, their clubs now aimed past the ladder, perhaps at the planet, perhaps at space, perhaps at the stars. We should be falling, boy Elsefani says. Why aren't we falling? Girl Elsefani stamps her foot, testing the firmness of the metal grid below us. The metal rings, then vibrates. Solid, she says. Does the floor keep us from falling down? Boy Elsefani shakes his head. It's in front of our faces, he says, pointing his bone club at the planet. We wouldn't fall down, we should tumble forward. He turns and looks at me. Shouldn't we, Em? He thinks I have any idea what's going on? Gaston pushes past them, slides around the ladder. He reaches out with both hands. I start forward, scared he is going to fall off the edge, but stop when his hands press against the barely visible curved wall. He leans forward, fearless. The stars aren't spinning. We are, he says. He turns, his smile wide, his face alive with joyous amazement. Hey, Aramovsky! Remember how Spingate said we were walking on the ceiling and you argued with her? Gaston points a finger straight up. I look. The ladder is still visible, but the tube around it is not. The ladder rises up into another impossibility. Spingate's cylinder. It is smaller than the planet, I think, but still so big my brain can't make sense of it. A coppery color, huge sprawling sides curving up and away the length of it stretching out and out and out, for I don't know how far. The surface is dented, scratched and pitted, like the hallways where the battles occurred. The cylinder doesn't spin at all. It is fixed in place above us. Only now do I truly understand what Spingate meant. We walked along the inside of that cylinder, as small as insects. We walked straight, but in a circle at the same time, until we looped up and around to wind up where we started. This ball-shaped room we're in is outside that cylinder, connected by the tube that contains the ladder. The metal grate floor of this ball is parallel to the cylinder. At the top of the ladder, I see two confused gray faces peering down, Bodden and Visca, probably wondering why they can suddenly see us. To them, it must look like we're standing in space. Gaston snaps his fingers and laughs. It's because the cylinder rotates, he says. 
that's what makes us stick to the inside. I can't quite remember how it works, but if it spun faster, we would feel heavier, and if it spun slower, we would feel lighter. That's why it's heavier here, in the ball, because we're actually spinning faster than the cylinder below us. The farther out we are, the heavier we feel. I bet at the center of the cylinder, we wouldn't weigh anything at all. We would float. Float? Gaston sounds even more insane than Brewer. What he says is impossible. But the room of dead babies taught me that when he talks, I should listen. I need to listen to him now. Aramovsky raises his hands, tilts his head back. Miracles, he says. We float above a planet. We float in space. But we do not die. The gods protect us. Brewer protects us. He truly is one of the gods. I turn back to the hideous head, hovering above the pedestal. We're in a ship, I say. I know it's obvious. The words just come out. A ship. All this time? It's called the Zolotl. I find it hard to believe Teresa didn't figure it out. Perhaps she is not as smart as she thinks she is. A shame to blame the game, but a tame dame never came to fame. He's blabbing again, talking to himself more than to us. I point behind me, toward the spinning brown, blue, and green planet. What is that? That was supposed to be our home, our new beginning. Well, for me and Bishop and Aramovsky, anyway. For you, my little savage bird, I doubt it would have been paradise, at any price, with or without sparkly ice. Gnarled black fingers come up to scratch his head. Fingertips dig between the wrinkles. He stops, puts his hands down, and stares at my symbol. M, he says, speaking the word like it is the answer to all questions. I can't believe I missed it. But of course, of course you survived. Of course you are the leader. Would you like to know your first name? My heart bangs so hard I feel it in my throat, in my ears. I need to know who I am. I nod. Very well. Your name is Matilda. Matilda. Matilda, Matilda. The word echoes through my head, discovers itself hidden deep in the blanked out areas. Yes, I know he speaks the truth. My name is Matilda Savage. The feeling of relief overwhelms me. Despite the horrors we've been through, the problems we still face, I can't help but smile. Bishop slaps his chest. What about me? What's my first name? The monster's spidery hand gives a dismissive wave. It hardly matters. Everyone knows you as Bishop, and Bishop you are. Brewer's voice lowers, softens, becomes sad and wistful. All of you can have what I can never possess. You could go to that planet. Gaston slides between me and Bishop. He moves close to the monster's face even closer than when I lost control and screamed horrible threats. Seeing little Gaston standing right in front of Brewer makes me wince, as if the monster might reach out, bite down, and drag Gaston into nothingness. Is it safe? Gaston asks Brewer. The planet? Brewer laughs so hard, his furrowed head tilts back, and he starts to shake. As before, the bone-scraping sound grinds into a coughing fit. This one racks his body, makes his limp hands flop about like boneless birds. Wetness bubbles up from leathery folds covering where his mouth should be. Grayish red glistens on black. It takes a few minutes for the coughs to ease. We wait. He finally gets it under control. Who are you, little tooth boy? I don't recognize you. My name is Gaston, Gaston X. The monster rubs a skeletal black hand across his face, across the leathery folds of his mouth. He looks at his palm, seems sad to see wetness there. Not fair, he says quietly. Not fair, Adair. He focuses on Gaston. Without the burns and scars, 
You aren't nearly as dashing, Xander. Yes, the planet is safe. Well, the air won't kill you anyway. Hopefully you can break the mold. If you can't, that was one very long trip for nothing. I wonder what it's like down on that planet. I tried to imagine a place with no walls. Sky instead of ceiling. Sky that goes on forever and ever. A place where the dust of the dead doesn't cover everything. Doesn't coat our tongues and invade our lungs. Something about that planet calls to me. I don't even care if it's safe. I would rather die down there than live up here. A very long trip. The centuries have not been kind. Brewer's words push and pull at my muddy mind. A sliver of memory sneaks out. A planet, but not this planet. Something brown, ugly. The thought slithers around like a snake, feeding, growing. Becomes almost clear. Another planet, a dying planet, a desperate need to flee. And then, I understand. The planet we're looking at doesn't just call to me. It calls to us. It calls to the sleepers. It calls to the birthday children. That's what this ship was made for, I say. To bring us here. The monster nods. Very good, Miss Matilda Savage. And the journey took a mere ten centuries. Bishop huffs. No one lives that long. Some do. Many more should have. But revolts can get in the way. A thousand years. If Brewer has been alive that long, maybe he is some kind of god. I think of all the bodies we've seen. So many corpses on this ship. A trip of a thousand years. More things click into place. The garden, I say. All that fruit. Food for the trip. And the pigs. Were they meant to be food as well? Filthy beasts. Did you know swine are smart enough to learn how to open basic husks? Simple buttons were a design flaw, I fear. Live and learn. They are always after that calcium. I warned against bringing swine. The smarter a creature, the less likely it is to behave. Once they get out of their section, there was no getting them back in. You don't see cows and chickens and sheep turning against their masters, do you? Gaston gives a doubtful look. Livestock? You need a lot of space for cows. And we haven't seen any cows at all, or chickens, or sheep. The image above the pedestal blurs and shifts. Brewer's head disappears. In its place, a grassy field with dozens of animals. They have black fur, like the pigs, but are much bigger. Are those cows? In the distance, I think I can make out thicket walls. So the garden isn't the only room with food after all. The image shifts again. A tall metal rack filled with small cages, and in each cage, a black bird. These I recognize, chickens. The image blinks, and we're again looking at Brewer's horrid head. Don't base reality on what you have seen, when you have seen very little. The Zolodal is vast far larger than your young minds can comprehend. You might say that the journey of a thousand years begins with more than a single flightless bird. This ship came from another planet, a trip that seems desperate and impossibly long. People must have worked together to make that happen, and it seems like they had plenty of food. How many people were on this ship before the killing began? Brewer, what happened here, I ask. What made you do these things to each other? He raises a long bony black finger and wags it side to side. Oh, no, 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 Miss Savage. You won't get me to laugh again, no matter how funny you are. What happened? Some people do not approve of being sacrificed. I look at Bishop. He shrugs. Brewer is talking in riddles, and I'm getting tired of listening to him. I feel Aramovsky's hand on my shoulder again, gently pushing me aside so he has room to speak. The bodies, he says. The adults, the children, they were sacrifices? I don't like the way Aramovsky speaks that word, so breathy and excited. Not all, many yes, 
Many more chose to not go gentle into that good night. For 20 years, this ship shuddered from war. A war to liberate those that did not need to be liberated. And in the end, they're all dead anyway. War, revolt, sacrifice. The grown-ups did this to themselves. It has nothing to do with us. If we stay here, we'll wind up like them. Butchered, burned, stripped bones and powdery dust. Brewer, how do we get down to that planet? You fly. Fly, fly, fly. A rocket in the sky. Down there you can start over. And never, ever, never worry your pretty perfect little heads about the real cost of your trip. About the sins of those who came before you. To get down there, you need a special ship. A shuttle. And oh, irony of ironies. As big as the Zolodal is, only one shuttle remains. A shuttle. The word calls up a flash of memory. A long ship with wings. It will take us away from here. We can go where we were meant to go, and maybe leave these monsters behind forever. One shuttle, I say. Does that mean if we take it, no one can follow us down there? Two gnarled hands rise up, slowly clap together. You understand what the word one means. And people said that Matilda Savage was stupid. Correct, no one can follow you, but you can also never come back. I fight to stay calm. If he's telling the truth, and I have no way of knowing that he is or isn't, we can leave this nightmare behind. Tell me where the shuttle is. Brewer sighs, a chest-puffing thing that rattles the black folds hiding his mouth. Long, long ago, during the revolt, I sealed your chambers off from the mutineers. I had machines destroy corridors, cut away floors, even melt doors to your area. I think about the first intersection we found, back when our long walk began, the black wall that looked like frozen ice. Brewer did that? To keep us safe? Why did you protect us? You say I killed you, yet you keep talking about how you kept us alive. Why would you do that? Brewer doesn't answer immediately. We wait, long enough that I'm not sure he heard me. I'm about to repeat the question when he finally speaks. I've asked myself that a million times, he says. His eyes have calmed down to a pale red. Sometimes, it is because I hope that I can change the way things work, even though I know that is impossible. Sometimes, it is for revenge. Sometimes, it is because if all of you die, who will I have to keep me company? These reasons and more. But looking at you now, maybe it is none of them. Perhaps the real reason is because I've known all along that you were made for the planet below. A millennium's worth of lies leads to a single truth. The future belongs to the young. If the old would kindly die and get the hell out of the way. I'm not entirely sure what all of that means. I latch onto one part of it. We were made to be down there, I say. You're right, I can feel it. Let us do that, Brewer. Let us go where we belong. Tell us where the shuttle is. Ah, yes, the shuttle. Fly, 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 like a rocket in the sky. For centuries they have tried to get to you, and for centuries I have stopped them. Sadly, Miss Savage, when I sealed you in, the shuttle was sealed out. You will have to go to the mutineer section and take it. And while you're there, see if you can find your bellow, because that is where she'll be. Bishop takes in a sharp breath of surprise. You think she's still alive? Perhaps, although I suppose that depends on your definition of the word. More riddles. I wish this thing would give us straight answers. According to Brewer, our way off the Zolodal is to go where these mutineer monsters are. We will have to face the things that attacked us, that took Bello. Bello, could we get her back and get out of here? I glance at Bishop, wondering if he's thinking the same thing. His chin is at his chest. He's staring at Brewer's image from beneath furrowed brows. If there is any chance to get Bello back, Bishop is ready to take it. Knowing he is with me gives me strength. 
I stand tall once again. Brewer, tell me how to get to the shuttle. The monster shakes his head. If they found you, then you found them. As the cleaning flea said to the dirty elephant, perhaps I missed a spot. Surely I can't let you sully a pristine, perfect planet if you're not smart enough to figure things out for yourself. I whip the spear down, a short arc that rips through Brewer's head in a spastic cloud of sparkles. The blade clonks against the pedestal top, taking a chunk out of the white stone. Stop playing games with us. We've already lost three people. The longer we stay, the more that will die. Let us go. He gazes at me for a long time. Maybe I kept you all in your husks because I didn't think you would survive outside of them. But you have. I tried to kill you, little savage, and yet here you are. And when you go, don't forget to take your little friends. I'll start waking them up now. Little friends? Does he mean there are more of us? Brewer, you- A sparkle wave ripples his face. His image bloats into a black cloud, then vanishes. Brewer is gone. Bishop nudges my arm. Em, what did he mean? The air above the right side pedestal flickers, glows. A black face with red eyes appears, but it is smaller and slimmer than Brewer's. Rage billows within me when I recognize it. It's the female monster I saw in the garden. She stares at me like I am the only one here. You found your way to the crystal ball. It used to be my favorite place. In a way, I suppose I should be proud. That voice, the voice of death, so similar to Brewer's, old and hissy and ancient and wrong, but different, so different in a way that makes me start to shake. I realize why the voice is familiar. I know this creature. My teeth grind as I fight to get my body under control. I can't show weakness, not now. I squeeze the spear shaft so tight it makes my fingers hurt. I am the leader of our group, I say. Who are you? The new monster shakes her head. You haven't figured it out yet. That's too bad. You are the leader of nothing. You are nothing. You aren't even a person. Why does her voice terrify me so? I know her. I know this thing. I know she hasn't always looked like this. I feel it in my chest, but I can't put the pieces together. I am a person, I say. We all are, including Bello. Give her back to us. You are property, the creature says. Her eyes narrow, the swirling red eyes squeezing into thin slits. You are an empty shell waiting to be filled, an egg with no yolk. You will lay down your weapons and stop fighting us. You will do it at once. That voice, that voice. My breaths are ragged gasps ripping in and out. My head hurts. A realization is bubbling up through my mind pushing away the muddy thoughts. And now that I almost have it, I suddenly, desperately don't want to know. I want my brain to stop, to leave it alone. But it's too late for that. Cold stiffness spreads through me, swirls in my belly and turns my heart into a frozen lump. Bishop's hand on my arm, reassuring, supporting. Whatever we face next, he will face it with me. I shake my head. We will not lay down our weapons. You should. It's a big ship, but there is nowhere to run. If we run, you will hunt us. If we kill you, then- Then you are forever free, the monster finishes. She knew what I was going to say, yet I've never spoken those words out loud. I've only thought them. A new strain of anxiety swirls inside me, a sense of foreboding and despair. The mud is sinking, retreating. A hard knowledge is solidifying. It's almost there, almost here, and I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I scream at her, a three-word roar, so loud it could shake the stars themselves. Who are you? You still don't know. Amazing. The truth erupts stabs through me like a thousand spears, 
shredding my flesh. I finally understand my fear, and I know why this thing is death. I recognize her voice, because it is mine. My name is Matilda Savage. 35. The monster is me. I am the monster. I want to shout out that this thing is a liar, but there is no point. At the core of all that I am, I know she is telling the truth. How can this be? How can I be in two places at once? How could I look like that? Everything goes black, falling. I feel Bishop's hands around my waist, lifting me. I must weigh nothing at all. It seems so easy for him. My feet find the floor. I stand on my own, woozy, head reeling. I look for my spear. Aramovsky is holding it. He's smiling. None of this bothers him. In his mind, the way things are is the way his precious gods want things to be. Go back up the ladder, M, he says. It's all right. I'll handle things from here. Bishop reaches out fast, tears the spear from Aramovsky's hands. Bishop hands the spear to me. Aramovsky doesn't stop smiling. Perhaps Bishop isn't the only one who wonders who would win a new vote. That's what Aramovsky said. At the time, I thought he was saying Bishop would win. But maybe he wasn't thinking about Bishop at all. Matilda speaks. Her voice drowns out all thoughts of Aramovsky. We don't need everyone, she says, now calm and loving. If you and the ones we do need put down your weapons, fulfill your obligations, then the ones we don't need will be allowed to live. She wants me to agree to this? The ones you don't need get to live, I echo, which means the ones you do need die? None of you will die. Not that any of you are alive to begin with. At least this way, some of you get to carry on with your excuse of an existence. Bishop snarls, shakes his head. He won't give up any of our people, and neither will I. Not to this vile thing, not to anyone. We refuse, I say. I will fight her, fight for my own life, fight for all of our lives. But I'm reeling, in danger of going as insane as Brewer. My voice is harsh and defiant one second, softly begging the next. How can I be you? I don't understand. Of course you don't. You're not old enough to understand. Just tell me. It's hard to know what her expressions mean when she doesn't have a human face, but she seems to be getting annoyed. Brewer woke you. He did it to hurt me, to hurt all of us, that bastard. Every moment you are awake, girl, it puts my life at risk. Every piece of information you learn, it puts my life at risk. How can that be? How can my learning something be a danger to her? We stare at each other. Two Matilda savages locked in a battle of wills, the same will, separated by whatever magic made this happen. She needs me, yet I want nothing to do with her. No, that's not true. I need to know what this is all about, and she can tell me. If you want me to consider your offer, I say, then explain how it's possible you and I are the same person. She sighs, a sound like ripping paper. I accept, but we aren't really the same person. I am a person. You are property. This ship traveled from a place to which we can never return. We left there to find a new home, a new world. We knew the journey would take centuries. To survive the trip, our bodies were permanently modified. They cannot be changed back. We were remade as you see us now. Ugly, I say before I can stop the word. Matilda nods. Yes, the process made us ugly. It also brought constant pain. Pain we have endured for longer than your unfinished mind can comprehend. When we started the trip, the cherished began cultivating copies of their bodies, making what we call receptacles. These receptacles were modified to survive on Omeocan, the planet below. Omeocan. Brewer didn't tell us the name of the planet. Omeocan. The word is a song that makes my brain tingle and my throat tighten. It is where we belong. 
She also used a word that Brewer said earlier, the cherished. Is she part of that group? Are we? I don't think it matters. If we can get to Omeo Can, we can leave this all behind. Receptacles grow very, very slowly. She's talking to me like I am a child, or stupid, or both. It takes a lifetime to grow one. When we arrived here, we were to transfer our thoughts and memories to the receptacles so that we could live on the surface without disease, immune from Omeo Can's subtle poisons that would have slowly killed us. I look at the planet hanging in the starry blackness. So, why didn't you do the transfer? On the way here, there was a, let's call it a disagreement. Some people had to be taught a lesson. Brewer was one of those people. The bastard tricked us, found a way to lock you away from me. You were supposed to come out of the husk two centuries ago, when your body was 12 years old, just as the scripture requires. But you didn't come out because of Brewer. Your body kept growing, becoming older and bigger than it was supposed to. My reality is crumbling. I was in that coffin for 200 years? No, that's the extra time I was in there. That's why our clothes are too small. They would have fit the 12-year-old me. And it's why they are so big on the people who died as little children. Had those kids stayed alive, they would have grown into their uniforms. But many, like the other brewer, didn't get that chance. You are the person who murdered me, he said. Now I understand. My skin crawls anew at the sight of this evil thing before me. You killed the brewer boy in our coffin room. He was just a child. Matilda scoffs, a sound like gravel scattered across a hard floor. Don't be so dramatic. Not a child, a receptacle. Nothing more than a shell waiting to be filled. You, little leader, are my receptacle. Understand now? You're not a person at all. Brewer has held you hostage for centuries, threatening to destroy my receptacle the way I destroyed his if we came after him. He must be dying. He woke you up out of spite so that I could know my chance to be born again was fading away forever. He did it to hurt me, to make me suffer. But he made a mistake. Now that you are out, he can't simply press a button and kill you in your husk. It's all so much, too much. Brewer said he protected us. Matilda laughs. Did he? No, it was his threat to kill you that kept me away all these years. But now his leverage is gone. I can finally have the reward I was promised. What she says is impossible. Yet again, I know she is telling the truth. I am her reward, like some animal to be given away as a prize. But she said I wouldn't die. Would this process fill in my missing memories? Would it end the madness of not knowing who I am? My parents, I might finally remember my parents. If you transfer your thoughts, what happens to me? Would I know what you know? Matilda pauses. In a manner of speaking, yes, we are the same person. The transfer would make us whole. She's not lying, but she's also not telling me all the truth. It would make you whole, I say. I asked what happens to me. If you do your transfer, what happens to the person I am? You are not a person. You are- I shake the spear at her. Then make another copy. You can't have me. You can't have any of us. The red eyes fade to a reddish pink. She visibly calms herself. The loving voice comes back. Does she think she can soothe me the way a parent soothes a little child? We can't make more receptacles. The process takes centuries. Mental maps, synaptic connections, baseline memories that form neural pathways. If these things aren't a match, if the foundation isn't identical, then the transfer can't overwrite. Overwrite. The word instantly terrifies me. The word is worse than death, worse than murder. If Matilda gets me, my body will live on. But who I am, what I am, that will be erased. I wasn't created to walk on Omeo Can. I was created to be destroyed. So if I'm you, why can't I remember? I know how to speak and read. 
but my past is all muddy, all blanked out. Why? Because you don't really have memories. Language, math, science, skills, those things are the framework of a mind. It is our experiences that make us what we are. Individual identity forms in the way we perceive things, the way we react, the way we feel. The knowledge your brain received while you were in the husk provided the biological scaffolding needed to support who I am. You're a shell, little leader. I am the yoke. You were made so that I can live. You're my only hope. Come and merge with me, now, so we can be as we were meant to be. I thought she was a monster because of the way she looks, but her evil goes far beyond appearances. She wants to make me vanish. She wants it to be like I never existed at all. And she's trying to make that sound like it is a beautiful thing. I shake my head. I refuse. The colors in her eyes darken, spin faster. You don't understand. You're not old enough to understand. I am your progenitor, and you're my receptacle. You can't make your own decisions. Maybe she knows more than I do, more than I could ever learn, but she doesn't know me. You're wrong, Matilda. I've been making decisions since the moment I woke up, and I'll keep making them. I think I get it now. The longer I live, the better the chance that you'll die. And you should have died a long time ago. She is so angry she shakes. I see a bit of fluid leak down the left side of her face, a thin rivulet that gathers in one wrinkle before overflowing it, oozing down to the next. What about the ones we don't need? She asks, obviously fighting to control her rage. Don't you want them to survive, little leader? Their progenitors are already dead, so they can't be overwritten. Come to me willingly and they will live. If I have to hunt you down, I will kill them all, each and every one. I will torture them first. Tell them that their agony is because of your selfishness. I will- You will never get me. The words come out like grinding glass. Matilda had her life, and she can keep it. My life is mine. You won't get me. You won't get any of us. She leans forward until her furious red eyes fill the air above the pedestal. I'll find you. Brewer held you hostage, but that is over. Come to the orchards, girl. You will come or I swear by Talalok that all of your friends will suffer. That name. Talalok, I say. I remember that name. Who is it? Matilda leans back. You're lying. You don't remember that name. You can't remember things like that. It's not part of the process. She's more agitated than angry now. She seems worried. Do you remember anything else? I do. I remember the smell of pork chops. I remember how it felt to be mocked and ridiculed. I remember that Tchaikovsky was a musician. I remember the trip to the farm. But if Matilda is this upset about that name, Talalok, telling her more could make her panic. She wants me to come to her. That gives us a little bit of time. Time we probably won't have if she comes after us instead. Not really, I say. Hints of things, vague emotions, but... I don't remember anything. Matilda's sigh of relief makes her face folds flutter. That's good. Brewer obviously made mistakes in the process, but it is not too late. The longer you are away from me, the more memories of your own you form, the more likely the overwrite will fail and we will both die. Come now, and I promise you that I will be humane to your friends. Humane? the same word I used when Bishop and I killed the pig. More wisps of memory filter in from that trip to the farm. The farmer told us that when they slaughtered the pigs, they tried to do it as quickly and painlessly as possible. He called that being humane. Kill them fast or kill them slow. The pigs all wound up dead. That's all we are to Matilda, livestock. She is a monster, a thousand year old abomination. She wants me to fulfill my destiny, a destiny defined by her. We are not your property, I say. Our lives are our own. The ugly thing shakes its head. Sooner than you think, hunger and thirst will drive you to me anyway. Throw down your weapons. Come to me now, and at least your friends will live. If we have to hunt you, 
They will all die. Last chance, girl. What is your answer? In that moment, I know that if I ever come face to face with Matilda, I will kill her. We are the birthday children, and we will find a way to survive. My answer is never, I say. And one more thing, you always were a bitch, savage. I look over to Elsa Fani, point at the three pedestals. Break those, then follow me. I turn my back on Matilda and walk to the ladder. I hear her screaming at me, saying something about how I must listen, how I must obey, how I'm not old enough to really understand. I start up the rungs, leaving behind the sounds of destruction. <laughs> <laughs>